Founded by Richard Byron in 1984, Computer Reset has been buying and selling used computers and parts for nearly three decades. And apparently Richard was buying a bit more than he was selling. I'm sure you have seen videos about this place already. If not, it was basically an 18,000 square feet warehouse, filled with vintage and rare computers. And when he passed away, his family decided to save as much as possible with the help of volunteers. In January this year, I went there to pick up some cool stuff for the channel. A bunch of other YouTubers were there as well. So you can watch LGR's second video about computer reset. If you want to see me stroll around piles of vintage computers and stacks of vintage parts, just look for the very picky chap with the smallest pile on his table. That would be me. The computer reset liquidation had been going on for quite some time when I went. So I was rather late to the game, and from what I could read online, I didn't expect to find all that much. But I went anyways. If nothing else, I wanted to have been there and see the place with my own eyes. Supposedly all 486 boards, all 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives and all rare desirable machines were already gone. And yet, I picked up a VLB board with a DX266 still in the socket and no less than 6 floppy drives, among other useful things for the channel. That board will of course make for a separate repair video. Noel and the volunteers also decided to let me have one of the five extremely rare and famous 7496 executive workstations. By the way, I have just ordered some more parts for it, so expect a new 7496 video in the upcoming months. A few weeks after my visit, the volunteers finally got the last vintage computer out the door. And a few months after that, the now rather famous computer reset finally closed shop. But Computer Reset will live on for a long time to come, on many enthusiasts workbenches and vintage computer caves. If you have watched a bunch of videos about Computer Reset, you know that among many other things, they had an incredible amount of the quirky and interesting PC Junior. Apparently Richard Byron saw something in these machines that the rest of the world didn't at the time. Not sure how many there were, but apparently they had huge piles of them. And they had been fixing them up and selling PC Juniors as a major project. Being high up on my bucket list, I asked if they still had one for me. But unfortunately, they had been sold out months ago. However, late the same evening, I got an email from one of the volunteers. And apparently one last PC Junior was found and put back together for me. And the next day it ended up becoming a thing. It was signed by the entire team of volunteers, and group shots were taken. This is the first video about the last PC Junior from Computer Reset. In this miniseries, we are going to restore this machine, find out what it's all about, and try to do something fun with it. And before we continue, I'd like to thank our sponsor PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Perfect for makers like us. Get an instant quote now at pcbway.com. And don't forget to check out their shared projects page. Browse among many open source projects for your favorite vintage PC. In 1981, IBM released the 5150 here. And it quickly became the de facto standard for what a PC should be. And in 1984, they released the PC Junior intended as a low-cost variant of the IBM PC, in order to compete with other home computers such as the Apple II and the Commodore 64. Unlike the IBM PC, the PC Junior chassis is made entirely of plastic. It has a single 5 and a quarter inch front bay with an optional floppy drive. Below the drive it has a pair of cartridge slots, as was common with other home computers at the time. PC Junior graphics were similar to CGA, but with several new video modes. The primary improvement over CGA is the color depth. CGA could only display four colors in its medium resolution mode, and only two colors in high-res mode. The PC Junior increased these to 16 and 4. Just like the IBM PC, the PC Junior has an Intel 8088, clocked at 4.77 MHz. Another major improvement was the sound which was provided by the Texas Instrument SN76496. 
which can produce three square waves and has one noise channel. Well, as we will find out, if you don't already know, the PC Junior is a very quirky and interesting little machine. I got my Junior complete with the original display keyboard and documentation, and a decent stack of extras. The display came in its original box and included some documentation. This is a service replacement order from IBM, and apparently it belongs to Boston Public School. The document doesn't say what was wrong with it, it just says exchange. It's dated on the 21st of December in 1990. That's six years after it was introduced. So what's the deal here? Well, the customer was charged for the exchange, obviously. It must have been out of warranty many years prior to this exchange. Overall, this display has one dent here. So someone bumped into it at some point. But aside from that, I'd say it's mint. There are no other dents or scratches, or even dust on this display. I have only made a very quick power on test and the image was a bit unstable and moved around slightly, just enough to drive me nuts. So I have prepared this video with a full set of fresh caps, in case we need them. Let's turn it on and see what we're up against. Well, that image is actually quite stable. So what's going on here? There is absolutely nothing wrong with that image. In fact, I'd say it's perfect. Well, perhaps it just needed to wake up from a very long sleep in that warehouse for those caps to start working as they should again. But from what I can see here, this display does not need a recap. The image may look a bit weird on camera, as CRTs often do. But I can assure you here in real life, that image is absolutely perfect. Let's boot again and take a look at those colors. Yeah, that looks really good. That tube is absolutely perfect. Well, that was a very nice surprise. And in that case, we only need to check for reefers. So let's pop that back off and take a look inside. And at the back here we have a date. Manufactured in June 1985. But I'm not sure if that's a good clue because the production had ceased way before 1990. And while we're here, the usual disclaimer applies. Don't poke around inside CRT displays. They may contain dangerous voltages, even with the cord unplugged. And at the back here we also have a serial number. And it's in the 300 thousands. And that may be quite close to how many they actually made. Because IBM only made 500,000 PC Juniors. And not all of them were sold with a display. And it's made in Japan no less. So we can expect some high quality components inside. Uh, there is a label from Computer Reset here, so it was tested good before I got it. So we've got two screws underneath and two screws at the top here. So, so far so good. No special tools seems to be required. And uh, The display has fixed cords, which is bloody annoying. So we probably need to remove these. Although I'm not sure. I guess I'll leave one of them loose. And uh, there are two more screws underneath here. But I think I'm gonna leave them in because they may be holding the PCB inside. And yeah, I think we are right. Let's lift this cover up. And it's stuck in the cord. So yeah, I think we need to remove these two screws to free up that cord. Okay, so let's try again. And we need to feed that bloody cord. Okay, well this is not new old stock. It does have some soot. Yeah, nothing extreme here, but it's definitely used. And the tube is from Mitsubishi. So I guess I'll make an inspection for reefer caps. Well, I think we're in luck. 
I can't see any bloody reefers. But it does smell a bit like it's been in storage for a few decades. So I'm gonna pull that PCB out and clean the display before we move on. And I noticed something here when I was about to remove the neck board. So someone else has been working on this display before me. Well, I soaked the case in soapy water and then I cleaned the tube and both PCBs with some alcohol. So the warehouse smell is gone and everything is nice and clean. But before we put it back together, let's see what IBM fixed on this board. And unfortunately there are shields on both PCBs underneath. So let's remove those and see if we can find any rework done to these boards. And the shield on this PCB is held in place with plastic tabs. So that's easy enough to remove. Let's see what we will find. Well, unfortunately it's really hard to tell because IBM left quite a lot of flux on this board. So there is no obvious way of telling if anything has been replaced here. And the same thing with the neck board. It's really hard to tell if anything has been replaced. So then I guess it's time for reassembly. Well, before we put the back cover on, I thought we'll see if it needs any adjustments. So I jumped into this menu here with Control alt insert And as you can see, it does need some minor adjustments. So the vertical center is slightly off. And the service manual doesn't tell how to adjust it, but I did found an adjustment knob. But it's not a pot, it's a switch, which is really weird. So we only get to choose between these modes. So never seen that in a CRT before. And all three modes are slightly off. There might be a pot inside for fine adjustments. The service manual doesn't tell. So if you know which one it is, please let me know. It's definitely not a big issue, but it's kind of annoying. And the horizontal size is slightly off too, so I'll see if I can find that pot. And here's that switch, really weird. So we get to choose from three different positions, but all three positions are slightly off. And I did check the board for more pots to make some fine adjustments, but I can't find anything. And you're not gonna believe this, but the bloody flickering is back. I'm not sure how well the camera picks this up. But there is a slight flickering, especially in this area here and down at the text, and it's extremely annoying. So I thought maybe there is some kind of interference. So I started to turn things off in the studio, but nothing helped until I moved the display. Now check this out. So I have moved the display to the left and the PC Junior to the right, and the flickering is gone. So what's up with this? Is the shield bad in the PC Junior or the display? Or could this be caused by some bad cap? If you have a PC Junior, try this out and let me know if you've got the same result. So I've been using CRT TVs and displays since the 80s and never had this issue before. I have had interference from all sorts of machines but never in this way. Normally I would get some kind of weird patterns or colors, often purple. If I would put the CRT too close to a speaker or 
something else that may cause interference. So problem sort of fixed, but not really. Let's try to put the display on the PC Junior and see what happens. And apparently that works too. So no flicker with the display on top of the machine. That's a bit bizarre. Are all PC Juniors badly shielded? Or is it something wrong with my display or PC? Hopefully someone will tell us in the comments. And by the way, these stripes that you see on the screen, I don't see them here in real life, so that's the camera's doing. I could remove them by setting the camera slightly out of focus, like this. But here in real life, the image is absolutely perfect. Well, this project got a rather weird start. I was expecting this video to be a recap video. And perhaps it should have been. I was a bit surprised when the flicker magically disappeared. And now I don't really know if this PC Junior is behaving normally or not. I'd love some feedback from other PC Junior users before I move on with the display. And what's up with that used replacement by the way? Why did IBM send a repair display to the customer? 250 bucks back in 1990 is roughly 550 in today's money. That's not cheap for a used CGA display. Why would Boston Public School decide to accept a 5 year old repaired CGA replacement in 1990 and pay that much money for it? I was working in a compact shop a bunch of years later than this, but I can't recall receiving any broken CRT displays from my customers. I guess by the time I started to work with CRTs, they had become very reliable and rarely broke down. So I don't actually know what the routine was at Compaq. Did they repair them too? Or did they just toss them and send a new display? And how did it end up at Computer Reset? Well, now I'm going to try out this cool little IBM for the weekend. And what better way is there than playing the original King's Quest? The PC Junior is considered a failure, but it had a major contribution to Sierra Online's success. King's Quest, Quest for the Crown, was originally released for the PC Junior, and has some minor differences to later releases. In fact, it wasn't even called Quest for the Crown when it was first released. Quest for the Crown was added to the game in the 1987 re-release. And since the Junior failed, King's Quest also almost failed, but luckily Tandy copied the PC Junior and made King's Quest a success. So perhaps the legacy of the PC Junior is the standard it set for Tandy to copy and improve on. I will of course continue this project in part 2, but that is not going to be the next video. Next week we are going to do some work on the Commodore PC-10 projects because a viewer has kindly made a couple of diagnostic ROMs for us to try out. And another viewer has left a comment that we don't need to disable the onboard graphics to get the graphics out of an ISA card. So we are ready for the next Commodore PC-10 video. Thank you for watching, if you want to support this channel, like, subscribe and leave a comment.